In the 1920s, Trotsky wrote uh, an important work called where is, uh, where is Britain Going? In this work, he gave a, a very good piece of advice. He insisted that uh, the British Marxists must study the revolutionary history of Britain. And many people think that Britain doesn't have a revolutionary history, but that's false. And he specifically insisted on a careful study of the Chartist movement and above all, the English Revolution of the 17th century. Now, it's a regrettable fact that very few Marxists have really studied this question seriously. It's a great shame because, in my opinion, the, the English Revolution of the uh, 17th century is every bit as important and every bit as inspiring and fascinating as the French Revolution. And in point of fact, if you look at it, it follows the same patterns. As a matter of fact, all, re all great revolutions, if you study them carefully, including the Russian Revolution, follow the same patterns. It's an absolutely striking proof of the correctness of historical materialism. Uh, the, the nonsense of the postmodernists who say that you, can't, that you can't draw any lessons from history. So it's entirely false. History has clearly defined patterns, if you care to look for them. And the patterns of the revolution are always the same. The laws are always the same. Even the personalities involved are the same. So it's, it's very striking. If, if you compare, for example, the characters of, uh, of the Tsar Nicholas uh, 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 of Russia and his wife, his German wife, you compare them to, uh, to uh, Louis XVI and his uh, Austrian wife, and uh, Charles I of England and his French wife, which we'll deal with, they're strikingly, they're almost the same. And the reason is, of course, similar circumstances demand similar results, certain, uh, even, even, even similar personalities, you, you, one might say. So I have to reduce my remarks. I've got 46 pages of notes here, which is obviously too much for one lecture, but I will be doing, a, I'm doing a book on this, so. And by the way, I must say that uh, in my researches on this question, I've come to the following conclusion. There's not one single solitary book about the English Revolution from a Marxist point of view that is acceptable. There was, of course, the uh, work, the, the writings, the copious writings of Christopher Hill, who was a member of the Communist Party, but his books, frankly, they're as dry as dust. It's like chewing sawdust re reading those works. Typical dry academic stuff, and academic Marxists, you know my opinion of, of those animals. Uh, uh, it's not, and it, above all, it's completely and absolutely lacking in any revolutionary spirit. You compare that, for example, compare these writings to the marvelous uh, works of Trotsky, particularly the history of the Russian Revolution, which is a scrupulous work of history, but at every page it, it, it blazes with revolutionary spirit. The French Revolution, if you know, more people have studied that, and there's some more or less decent works about that. Trotsky was very fond of, you know, the, the, the book that he recommended on the French Revolution was not the works of Marxists, socialists like uh, Jaure and so on. He recommended the work, the, the, the work by Kropotkin, the anarchist, called The Great French Revolution. I also recommend that book. Of course, it contains, it's written from an anarchist perspective, but Trotsky admired that book for one reason. It revealed clearly the role of the, the crucial role of the masses, the movement from below, which impelled the revolution, uh, the French Revolution forward in, in, all its, uh, in all its stages. But you see, in the English Revolution, this is lacking. But it's not lacking. A serious study of the English Revolution shows exactly the same thing. It's the role of the masses that's key to any understanding of this revolution. But let's start, because you, you know, I think it's been stated here, all great revolutions tend to start at the top, not at the bottom. The first indications of the development of a revolution is a split at the top, splits in the ruling class, which is unable to, to rule in the same way as it did in the past. Now, what period are we dealing with? I would like to have dealt with the, the historical background, the rise of 
English, British English capitalism, I'd have to say, at this stage. There's no time for that. I therefore I regretfully will have to leave the economic and the history of British development of British capitalism to one side. Let's deal here with the, some of the personalities involved. Because, by the way, Marxism, historical materialism, has never denied the role of uh, individuals in history. Oh, no, 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 no. Individuals and personalities can play a powerful role in history. Yes, what is not true is that they determine everything. That's false. The individuals and the personalities concerned are conditioned and restricted by the historical context in which they have to, to operate. Let's deal with some of the dramatic person. I starting with Charles I, King of England, the son of James I, who was the founder of the Stuart dynasty, came from Scotland, as a matter of fact. James, of course, I, won't, I would like to deal with him. That's a separate question. But he was quite a smart character, uh, James, James I. He was a cunning old fox. He came from Scotland to, of course, Scotland was very poor. England was very rich. He came with all his, his mates, his courtiers, to, to, to London. And, of course, he must have thought he'd landed in paradise. And therefore, of course, he was quite prepared to, to, to accept certain things, for example, Protestantism and so on and so forth. Because, of course, there was a lot of money involved, which he could spend uh, as much as he liked on a lavish lifestyle, lavish court, his favorites uh, at court, and so on and so forth. He spent a, a pile of money. And therefore, he left his son, Charles I, with a pile of debts. Also, the little detail of foreign wars, which tended to be expensive in those days, because army, armies were mercenary uh, armies. So Charles I came to power with a bankrupt treasury, in effect. And by the way, there are certain parallels, even today, and in the French Revolution, the same thing. The treasury was empty. And this is a, like austerity today. It poses certain problems. It restricts the conduct of the ruling class. What sort of man was Charles I? You know, you can find out very easily. Don't, don't bother to read books. Go to the National Gallery. It's free of charge. It's just down the road in, in Trafalgar Square. And look for the portraits of King Charles I by the great Dutch artist Van Dyck, or Van Dyck, I think is probably his correct pronunciation. You see the character of the man there. The arrogance, the opulence, the idea that uh, I am king and you are my subjects. Oh yes, Charles I was a, a very arrogant man who firmly believed in the principle of the divine right of kings. That he and he alone had the right to rule without any restriction or control whatsoever. The problem that uh, Charles faced is that it wasn't true. In England, <laughs> in England, he could not do just what he liked because, here we come to the historical materialism, the historical aspect, this was the period of the rise of the bourgeoisie. Capitalism had already, in effect, triumphed in England for a period of maybe a century or two centuries before. And the bourgeois, therefore, Charles, there was one power, if you like, state was divided, put it that way. One power based on the, the court, the monarchy, and the clique around the monarchy. And the other power, of course, was the parliament. Parliament also was divided into two houses, which is still the case now. That shows, by the way, the botched nature, of the, the incomplete nature of the, of the English Revolution. We still have to put up with the consequences today. The House of Commons and the House of uh, Lords. Well, as stated, the House of Lords was the House of Lords. The aristocrats, the wealthiest uh, layers of society. The House of Commons was dominated mainly by the bourgeoisie, the, the rich merchants, the bankers, the capitalists, the nascent uh, bourgeoisie. Now, what, and therefore the two forces came into collision. Charles, to put it bluntly, needed cash. A lot of cash. Partly because, like his father, he was interested in a lavish lifestyle. You see this in the portrait. So look at his dress. Extravagant dress, pearls, jewels, all kinds of things. <clears throat> and also wars with Spain, with France, and so on. He needed wars. He didn't have the money. The House of Lords didn't have much money. The aristocracy was in a state of decline. All the money, all the wealth of the kingdom was in the hands of the House of Commons, the uh, parliamentarians. Now, another question which you have to understand is the question of religion. 
which confuses people when they look at the English Revolution. They say, oh, well, yes, it was the, the Puritans versus the Pres Presbyterians and so on. It was a religious question. Now, that's not wrong. Religion played a huge role in the English Revolution because it took place early on. Over a century later, later in the French Revolution, it's much more, the bourgeoisie is more advanced. They're the atheists. They fight for, for the kingdom of reason. Yes, but this was an early period. It was the period internationally of a titanic struggle between two forces, two elemental forces. The force represented by the Roman Catholic Church, which represented the status quo, that's to say the, fundamentally the defense of the feudal system, the privileges of the aristocrats of the monarchy and so on, and Protestantism, which, were, which erupted on the scene with the, with the uh, defiance of, uh, of Martin Luther and later Calvin and other people, who challenged this church, and it was necessary. There was no question of a fight to change society unless the power of the Catholic Church was destroyed, was overthrown, with all its trappings and extravagance and so on and so forth. And therefore, you could say at this time, Protestantism represented the rising bourgeoisie. We must understand this. When you look at the English Revolution, you see a bewildering array, array of different groups and sects and churches and so on. Yes, what you have to understand in those days, two things. First of all, religion then was not the same as now. Nowadays, most people are indifferent to religion, don't believe in it, or don't, at least don't practice it, don't go to church, don't go to the mass, and so on and so on. Not the case at this time. You're coming out of the Middle Ages where the church occupied an absolute spiritual dictatorship. The church dominated every aspect of life. You had to go to church. You couldn't be sitting in a... IMT meeting in those days uh, on a Sunday morning, you'd, be, you'd go to jail. You had to attend church. It was the law. And, and, and people believed in this. People believed passionately in religion, in God, in the devil, in heaven and hell, in your immortal soul. This was a, not a secondary uh, matter. It was a fundamental importance. Don't you believe it? And therefore, what you must understand there were no political parties because there was no political life as, as you would understand it. No democracy, no genuine elections. Parliament was completely uh, unrepresentative. It represented those layers I've described. The upper house was the aristocracy. The lower house was the bourgeoisie fundamentally. Yes, but the, the, you see, the, the, the different religious trends were, were, were political parties. That's what they were. Let's go through them. You, on the extreme right wing, of course, you have the, the Catholics, which, who'd been defeated in Britain. The, the British Reformation took place before this, under Henry VIII, you know, the fat guy with the beard, you've probably seen pictures of him, you know. But, uh, but yes, but, but the, the Reformation in England was different to the continent. It wasn't the same as Germany, it wasn't the same as the Netherlands, and so on. In England, Henry broke with the church only from, the, from a dynastic point of view as a maneuver because he wanted to divorce his Spanish wife, who was naturally Catholic, fervent Catholic, and marry Anne Boleyn, who, by the way, was a equally fervent Protestant. And in order to do this, he had to break with Rome. The Pope wouldn't allow it, also for political reasons. Therefore, the, a struggle took place. But if you think about it, when Henry VIII broke with Rome and set up the Anglican Church, Protestant church, if you like. The only real difference, people don't understand this, the only real difference is that instead of the Pope being the head of the church and choosing the bishop, it was Henry, it was the king. As far as the, uh, the actual ritual of the church was concerned, there was very little change. It wasn't really, it wasn't a thoroughgoing reformation as took place in Germany and in Geneva with Calvin and so on. Not so. So that the, the, the Roman Catholics were there as a, as a tendency, but in Britain they were, a man, they were a minority, they were a persecuted minority for this reason. They were persecuted because the king insisted that he was the head of the church, not the pope, and therefore the Catholics were, uh, in effect, persecuted. Then you had the Anglican Church. Yes, but the Anglican Church also was divided. There was the High Church. Charles I was a member, was, belonged to the High Church which maintained the same rituals, the same incense, the same priests, the same bishops, the same images as before. They were the, the, the right wing, the conservative party, if you like. And then, of course, you had other Protestant movements, like the, 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 the bourgeois, 
There was the Presbyterians who represented, if you like, the Blairites, the, uh, the, the, the right wing of, of the revolutionary uh, bourgeoisie, if you like. The moderate opposition to the king, his, his majesty's loyal opposition. Yes, that, that was in Parliament. The Presbyterians were quite dominant in Parliament. But there were others, the Calvinists, the Lutherans, and outside Parliament there was a bewildering array, a myriad of, of sects which were based on the, on the poorer layers, on the middle class, the independents, for example. Cromwell was, where's his statue? Was there somewhere? Bring, bring a statue over here so everyone can see. Since I will mention Cromwell more than once. Here he is. Cromwell, what, who was Oliver Cromwell? Oliver Cromwell was uh, not a poor man. He was a member of the middle class. He was a small farmer to the east of London, not far from Cambridge, in East Anglia. He was a squire, a small landowner. And he was an independent, a Protestant, a more extreme Protestant than the Presbyterians. And then to the left, because we're going from right to left, to the left, there's a myriad of groups like the Anabaptists, the Fifth Monarchy Men, you've never heard of them, but they were around, and all kinds of other, other sects, right? Each one more radical and more Protestant and more anti-Catholic than the rest, okay? Ultimately, you get the formation, the crystallization of, in effect, political trends who also had a strong religious flavor. Don't, don't make any mistake about this. The levelers who were the extreme revolutionary Democrats and finally the diggers, the true levelers as they call themselves. They're our spiritual ancestors. They're our political ancestors. <coughs> The first communists in, 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 in Britain were the, the, the diggers. But we'll come to those trends later. Let's go back to the main conflict. Charles needed money. And there was a permanent tussle, a permanent struggle between the monarch and the, and the bourgeoisie in Parliament over the question of money. Of course, the, the, the bourgeoisie was not against providing subsidies to Charles on condition that he would grant them more power. In other words, what we're dealing with here is a, is a struggle for the possession of state power between two rival classes. Bear that as, as, as strictly in, in mind. And this led, of course, to uh, very sharp conflicts, very bitter conflicts, in which repeatedly Charles dissolved Parliament. He could do this. He had absolute power. He said, all right, you won't give me money for my wars. I dissolve you. You don't exist anymore. This happened on several occasions. There was also, of course, a, 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 as always, a religious component in this. Charles, in, I think in 1625, he got married. First of all, he tried to get married to, he was pushed into a marriage with a Spanish uh, princess. That didn't work, it ended very badly. He got married to a, a French princess, the, 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 the daughter of the, the, Fren the French king, uh, Henrietta Maria who, of course, was a Catholic. Not just a Catholic, a devout Catholic. Bear in mind, Catholicism in Britain was prohibited, but she was allowed, by special uh, uh, rule, special dispensation, to, 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 to carry on her religion, Catholic religion, in private, in her own chapel. By the way, you can see that chapel today. I visited it with Anna a few months back. It was a very, not anymore, but it was a very lavish she turned this into a lavish uh, alternative center of religious power. She filled this chapel every Sunday. So the mass was celebrated. She was constantly accompanied by her father, confessor. And she flaunted her Catholicism, went into the streets and so on and so forth. And of course, this provoked, this rankled. This was more than annoying for... Uh, ordinary people. If you, it's quite a good film, actually, not a bad film, made years ago called Cromwell, with Richard Harris playing Cromwell. It's not a bad film, it's just a typical what you'd expect, but it's not bad. <laughs> There's a scene where Cromwell visits the, the royal palace, he sees the queen, and he sees there's a crucifix on the wall, and he really, you can see <laughs> the fury on his face as he sees this papist abomination, the cross, and so on and so forth. All this was an abomination. By the way, incidentally, there's, there's a reason for this. Asceticism, you know, is present in every revolutionary movement because the poor people have nothing and they're against wealth. The ruling class 
show off their wealth and their riches ostentatiously as they do today. And it rankles with ordinary people. Same with religion. This high church business with stained glass windows and, and uh, images and statues and so on to, uh, to uh, a, a period. And this was an abomination. You see, unlike the Catholics, who, who don't read the Bible, <laughs> the Protestants did read the Bible. Very carefully. Yes, it was a democratic thing. The extreme Protestants were against all priests, bishops, all ostentation in the churches, singing, statues, stained glass windows. Whenever they could, they smashed it up. They did it, even on Henry VIII, they did that. Iconoclism. That reflects... The burning anger, it's not very nice, works of art were destroyed, you get these characters, art historians, weeping tears over this, but you've got to understand the ordinary people. To them, this is an abomination. It's in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. It's in the Ten Commandments. And therefore these images and saints and so on and so forth. An absolute abomination. They smashed them up as often as they could. So there was a clash. And therefore, the conduct of the Queen was a permanent source of, uh, to say irritation is putting it, uh, is putting it uh, mildly. Charles, of course, all these monarchs, always, there's always a, 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 a clique. In the Russian uh, czarist setup, you had Rasputin and the, the queen who was very close to Rasputin and so on and so forth. Charles had his clique, led at that time by the Duke of, uh, the first Duke of, B Buttingham, of Buckingham, Charles Villiers, his name was. It's also the favor favorite of his father. Uh, and of course, this man was hated. There's a common feature very often with monarchies of this type, that it, uh, you don't attack the monarch, don't attack the king, but you attack his favorites, you attack his ministers. They're responsible. Buckingham was held responsible for unpopular foreign wars. There's one particular incident where in France, by the way, you must bear in mind the international context. This is the period of the Thirty Years' War, another subject which is not generally known. Marx and Engels explained that in Germany, the uh, peasant war in Germany could have led to a, a bourgeois, bourgeois revolution at that time. It failed because of the betrayal of the bourgeois, the conduct of the princes, and also the betrayal of Luther himself. That failure was an absolute catastrophe for, for Germany, which then became the center of an atrocious, bloody 30 years of massacres, of slaughters, of wars with foreign interventions of Spanish armies, Swedish armies, all kinds of armies rampaging through, through the country, destroying everything. Ger Germany was reduced to a wasteland with terrible massacres. The stories of these massacres were whole cities were, were wiped out, men, women, and children slaughtered. By, by the Catholic armies in particular, were, they, they did this. They weren't alone in the, in the atrocities, but they, 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 they played the main role. This was known. This is the period of the printing press. People knew about these things. The pamphlets circulated. Or the St. Ba Bartholomew's Massacre in France, where in Paris, the whole of the uh, Huguenot Protestant population, men, women, and children, were, were, were slaughtered on the streets. Streets were running with blood. People knew about this, and therefore, there was a burning hatred of Roman Catholicism and an and a extreme suspicion of anything that smelt of Catholicism, and also, yes, a fear of Catholicism. People were, were frightened. People were scared. This is going to come here. We're going to be massacred, and therefore, we can't have this. The Duke of Buckingham actually tried to pull a stunt. He, he led, led a a naval expedition which was supposed to help the French Huguenots, the French Protestants who, who controlled the city of La Rochelle. In effect, he was going to support the French king. This was known to the sailors. The sailors mutinied. The sailors, like most people at this time in Britain, were Puritans of one sort or another. These poor sailors were Puritans. When they discovered that they were going to betray the, the Protestants of France, they rebelled. And this, this was known. Also, it rankled. So they took their revenge. The Duke of Buckingham, this handsome cavalier, went to Portsmouth one day to review his fleet and he was stabbed to death by a man, I think his name was John Felton. Stabbed him in the back, his last words were, the, the, the rogue has killed me. This deeply upset Charles, as you can imagine. He was uh, shaken by it. 
Yes, but the people were delighted. John Felton became a national hero. hero. People were singing ballads in his praise all over the country. This is the red light. This is the warning light. If only Charles could have seen it. It's the warning light to the monarchy that things were coming to a head. Now, the, the fall of Buckingham, of course, leads to the formation of another court clique uh, involving three persons, a trio. The Queen, naturally, who played an important role in this, same as the, the wife of uh, Nicholas and Ari, Marie Antoinette played in the port, the same kind of thing, egging on, push, pushing their husbands into conflict with Parliament, in conflict with other people. What's the matter with you? Are you a man or a mouse? Why didn't you grow a pair of balls, they would say, tell them, in, in private. You know, this is, this, not exactly with those words, but the equivalent. You know? it played, it, undoubtedly, it played a role. Charles was also a weak individual. It played a role. So there was the Queen. Then there was the new favourite, the uh, Earl of uh, Thomas Wentworth. It's quite a smart individual who originally had been a, a left winger, but they bought him. They bought him over. The Earl of Strafford. He sub subsequently became. He was sent to Ireland then to, to to squeeze the Irish to raise taxation for the for the monarchy. He was very popular in Ireland. He earned a nickname, Black Tom Tyrant. They called him. He was the the king's representative in Ireland. And the third. Perhaps the most important representative, Archbishop William Laud, L-A-U-D, Archbishop of Canterbury. He was a man from a humble origin, quite a smart guy. He rose to this high position. He was the second in command in the state, in effect, and he controlled the Anglican Church with an iron rod. And he, same as the king, controlled the state. He did, by the way, by this time he dissolved Parliament yet again. And Charles now was re ruling, ruling on his own for 11 years. 11 years of tyranny, as the people would say. He ruled the state with an iron rod. And Archbishop Lord ruled the church with an iron rod. And the two were linked. You must see the connection. Charles understood the connection very clearly. His father, and James, understood this. He told his son, look... The church is the basis of the state. The church is the basis of your power. Without the church, the church falls, the monarchy falls. And that wasn't uh, a bad uh, analysis. He was quite, quite sharp. See, and Charles understood this. And therefore, for him, the same way the state should be ruled with an iron hand, complete and absolute control, the same for religion. No dissent. No Puritans. He was a bit more lenient with the Catholics. Although they weren't allowed that. It had to be the Anglican Church. Not the Anglican Church. And the Archbishop Lord. It had to be the High Anglican Church. Which in essence was the same as Catholicism. The same rituals. This. If I had the time I could read very interesting, very amusing descriptions of, of the actions of Lord. Who turns, turns up and uh, prostrates himself in front of the images and uh, incense and all, all kinds of stuff like that. Everyone, the priests had to wear these rich garbs and so on and so forth. All this was anathema to the Protestants, but it was imposed. You had to support the state religion, which is the Anglican religion. You don't do that. It's the equivalent of not just blasphemy. It's the, the equivalent of uh, betrayal. Of, of, of You're a traitor. And traitors' deaths was not a very nice, uh, not a very pleasant uh, Spectacle. Yes, he ruled with an iron with an iron hand. Of course, this, as they say in physics, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. People did react violently. There were different elements involved. There was an economic element. Charles again, he still needed to raise castle without Parliament. This was illegal. The king was supposed to get the permission of Parliament to pass taxes. But the king introduced, well, he didn't exactly introduce it because it, it existed before, actually. It was an old law called ship money. This meant that all coastal uh, towns and cities had to pay a tax, a special tax, allegedly for the upkeep, uh, upkeep of the Royal Navy, the fleet for the protection of the ports, shipping, commerce, and so on. He then extended this tax to inland cities who were not on the coast at all, nothing to do with the... Uh, naval questions, which provoked a furious reaction 
People like Pym and Hamden and so on, were bourgeois, refused to pay the tax. Many people refused to. Many people, many towns refused to pay the tax. So there was the elements there of a revolt. And on the religious question, this really hurt. It hit people where it hurt most. You're talking about my eternal soul. I'll be damned by this uh, business. And people resisted, refused to conform, and they were brutally treated. Any priest that refused to carry out these measures was kicked out of the church. And any ordinary people that resisted was subject to the most savage punishments you could imagine. They had their nose cut off, their ears cut off, a nail driven through their tongue, whipped until uh, they were almost uh, dead. This happened to, to many people. And it became, of course, an absolute uh, scandal, and an example of absolute tyranny, which it was. There was one person, one young man, probably the same age as most of you, who was, because he was distributing, because this was happening, there was resistance, he was distributing leaflets in the street, same as you would distribute leaflets or sell the paper in the street. He was distributing leaflets in, attacking these abuses. He was caught and tried by the Star Chamber. The Star Chamber, again, was something left over from the past, a bit like the Inquisition, outside of all legal restraints and all laws and all restrictions and so on. This young man, I'm just taking the one, I, there's a reason I'm picking on this example, was sentenced to be whipped through the streets of London, from the centre of London right, right to, to, uh, to Whitehall, for his crime of expressing criticism. He was whipped until he bled, the, the blood was streaming down his back, and he got so bad at one stage he collapsed, and as he was sitting in the, uh, in the gutter, covered in blood and dust, a representative of the star chained up, I don't know whether he took, took pity on him, he came up and said, look, give us your word that you'll stop doing this, and uh, this will stop. He refused. He was then put in the pillory, which is a terrible uh, torture of being uh, stuck in wooden stocks and uh, ill-treated, and he still refused. All the time he was going through the streets being beaten, he still shouted his ideas to the, to the passers-by. And a huge, a huge number of people gathered. You see, this is the point. It wasn't just one individual. A huge multitude of people of Londoners gathered to, to, to give support to this man, whose name, you might have heard of him, was John Lilburn. John Lilburn was <coughs> subsequently the head of the Levellers, which is the extreme left wing of the English Revolution. He refused, point blank, to make any concession. That was typical of him. He was then... Th loaded with chains and thrown into a dirty, dark, filthy du dungeon. He said subsequently that was far worse than being whipped, this terrible dungeon full of rats, where he was kept for a couple of years, until he was freed by the revolution. You see, now here you have explosive elements taking place. And yet, for 11 years, Charles, he seemed to have got away with it. He seemed to be, he was in complete control. Lord was in complete control of the church. There was no problem. He was squeezing money out of people. Anyone that stepped out of line would, would be sentenced to this kind of torture, which I referred to. And yet, and yet, and yet, it all came unstuck. He made a mistake. He went too far. These absolute monarchs tend to, tend to go too far. He went too far. He made one big mistake. Having complete control of the Church of England, he then tried to impose this new religious system on the church in Scotland. Now, Scotland at that time was really part of, it wasn't yet the United Kingdom, it wasn't yet, it was formerly an independent country, but under the Stuarts, the Stuarts, who don't forget were Scottish in origin, there was, a, shall we say, there was a close link. And Charles was confident that he would succeed in pushing through this reform of the Church of Scotland. Big mistake. You know the Scottish people? You know anything about the Scottish people? They are very stubborn people indeed. You know. They're a very stiff-necked lot, if you like. And also, uh, an interesting point, the Reformation in Scotland went far further than England under people like uh, John Knox. It was a Presbyterian country. It wasn't High Anglican at all. And yet, they were forced now to accept this new system. 
I've forgotten the actual date, my notes are here, but I, I don't have time to consult them. But this would have been in 1640, I believe, or 1639. Imagine the scene. You're in Edinburgh Cathedral, imposing building. Okay, it's packed with people, men and women. By the way, women played an important role in the English Revolution, not generally understood. And here you see the role, the role of the masses. The Archbishop of Scotland now, in all his finery, mounts the lectern, mounts the, the where the place is where, where he, he, and takes up the new Book of Common Prayer and begins to read. Whereupon, all hell was let out in the, in the cathedral. People stood up, women, starting with the women, by the way, started shouting and screaming. The mass is, the mass is among us, the, the Catholic mass. This is the mass. And they started to throw things at the, at the, bishop, at the archbishop. Bibles, the Bibles in those days were quite heavy objects, you know. <laughs> Must have been a painful thing. They started, the women started this, they started pelting with Bibles. The poor man was dodging this, and somebody at the back, I don't know who, threw a stool at him. The footstool threw a stool. Fortunately, it missed his head, or he would have been in hospital. <laughs> the guards were called to keep order. This, imagine, this is a packed church. The guards struggled with the people. Imagine, they, they finally managed to push people out, whereupon there was a riot in the streets. The streets were full of a, of a multitude of people. The role of the masses intervened decisively. We're not having this. No bishops here. No bishops. The, the cry went out. No bishops. The bishops were attacked everywhere, over, all over Scotland. Bishops, their carriages were attacked. They were, they were dragged out, beaten up. Some of them were killed. In the end, all of the bishops had to flee to England. Now, one would have thought, wouldn't one? Scotland, by the way, was uh, in a state of revolutionary uh, ferment now. Everywhere. The, the tables were set up, same as we set up a table to sell out there, with what is known as the Covenant. The covenant of the Scottish people refusing to accept bishops, refusing to accept any change in religion imposed from London. Thousands and thousands of people were queuing up to sign the name to this petition. The Scotland was, was, was aroused. Now, one would have thought that if Charles I had an atom of sense, his father probably would have seen what the, the score was, he would have backed off. Okay, well, you can have your religion, leave it. Oh, no, no, this is Charles I. Wasn't going to accept this humiliation. And therefore, he, he decided that he would uh, impose his position by military means. 1640, you know, what, what's known as the Bishops' Wars. This is the real beginning of the English Revolution. The Bishops' Wars, you've probably never heard of them. The wars over the bishops. He sent an army into Scotland, a mercenary army into Scotland, which was met by the Scottish army, led by efficient officers who had been trained in the Thirty Years' War, composed of dedicated, serious, fervent Protestants. People were fighting for something that they believed in. And the English soldiers ran like rabbits. It was humiliating. Even before they, came, they ran like rabbits. They were defeated. Now Charles has got a problem. He still wants to invade Scotland. He hasn't got enough money to pay for an army. He therefore has to reconvene Parliament in the firm belief, poor man, that the Parliament now would see reason because this is, we're being invaded by a foreign army, that's how he characterized the Scots, and therefore we should uh, all unite for patriotic purposes against the common enemy. Big mistake. Another big mistake. In fact, the Parliament was far more sympathetic to the Scottish Presbyterians than what they were to William Lord and uh, King Charles. Furthermore, they grasped the opportunity. They said, okay, my friend, my fine feather friend, you want money from us? <coughs> Deliver a list of demands. A list of demands, which is like the transitional program, if you like. You know, it's like uh, Marlon Brando in The Godfather. You know the famous line? I made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Well, now they were making him an offer he couldn't accept. A series of demands, including punishment and trial of his most intimate collaborators, of this ruling clique, starting with the Earl of Strafford, that they blamed. he was the head of the army in Scotland, they blamed him. He was a close friend of Charles, intimate, close friend. 
But Charles, of course, apart from his many other uh, characters of arrogance and so on and so forth, was also a coward and a treacherous uh, man, a, a weak, treacherous man, who was quite prepared to sign the, the death warrant of his friend, uh, his intimate friends that he signed. And Stafford was duly put on trial by the Parliament and executed as, the, as an enemy of the people. This was really the, the beginning. Now, once Charles had time to, to collect his... By the way, the second army was also defeated. And the Scots advanced and they occupied Newcastle and Durham. You know? And the, 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 the English were forced to negotiate with them. They were present on English soil. They invaded England. Just imagine. And part of the demands, you imagine, they were, by, by, by this time, the, the Scots, you can, you can imagine, were euphoric, having defeated two English armies and advanced as far as Newcastle. They were quite pleased with, pleased with themselves. They therefore put a list of demands in order to withdraw, including, you, pay, you must pay the way, until we get a satisfactory settlement, the English Parliament must pay all the wages of our soldiers that are occupying uh, <laughs> Newcastle and Durham. Not a bad... Uh, it's a bit like uh, in a strike where the, you demand, we demand payment for the time we were on strike from the, from the employers. So Charles was in a pickle. But of course, he realized now that the parliament was really refractory now. They put even more demands. Demands which, this time demands for the arrest of Archbishop Lord and so on, which if they'd have been met. And above all, a key demand. It tends to get lost. But it's key. Lenin said that in the last analysis, state power is armed bodies of men in defense of private property. Armed bodies of men. That was the case at that time. Except that at that time there was no real standing army in England. It didn't exist. But there was a militia. There were militias. Parliament demanded control of the militia. That means to say, we want control of the state. Now, if, if Charles had accepted this, he'd already accepted the death of Strafford. If he'd have accepted that, it would have meant, in effect, the end of his power, the end of the absolute monarchy. He wasn't prepared to accept it. He had two choices, either accept and lose everything or fight. So he chose. He entered Parliament at the head of a group of soldiers, unannounced, in order to arrest the ringleaders of what he considered a conspiracy. Five members of Parliament Due to, due to be arrested. He turned up. He demonstrably sat in the speaker's seat. You know, the speaker is the chairman of parliament. He sat in the seat and glared around the room, demanding that the five uh, offenders be handed over. Of course, they'd gone. They'd been tipped off. You see, such was the... the you must uh, imagine the tension that exists now in society. It reached even the upper layers. It, it even must have reached his own circle. And somebody in Charles's circle must have tipped off the parliament. Hey, look, you better get these guys out of here because they'll be arrested. They, was, they were tipped off in time. Charles looked around the room and uttered the immortal phrase, I see the birds have flown, which they had, they'd gone. But the, that, this is generally known. Every school child has read these uh, statements. What is not known is what happened afterwards. I mean, imagine the, the tumult in parliament you could imagine. But even greater than that was tumult on the streets of London. People don't know this. This is the role of the masses. The masses now were up in arms. And the focal point of their resistance to the monarchy was the parliament. This resistance. Let's be clear how it goes. This is the, booze, the, the bourgeoisie, the wealthy merchants, the moderate Presbyterians confronting Charles for their own benefit. Yes, but this split, in, look at the process. This split in the state, split in the ruling class, transmitted itself to the masses. It came on the streets. When Charles left Parliament, got into his royal carriage, went through the streets of London, through the city, he was mobbed by a mass of angry people, poor people, banging on the, the doors of his uh, carriage and shouting, privilege, privilege, meaning the, the parliamentarians must have privilege against the rest. You can't go around arresting, <laughs> arresting our parliamentarians. That's the way that it will be seen. Charles was so terrified that he decided to leave London there and then. He had a palace in, in White, Whitehall. He left with his wife. He was particularly concerned that his wife would be put on trial. You know, they got Stafford, then they got Lord, who was also executed. 
you thought that Maria and uh, uh, Henrietta Maria would be in action, therefore they had to clear, clear out quickly. So we went, out, we went north, where the monarchy he thought had a more solid base. Now, this is all of the masses. It's not seriously dealt with in most history books. But I'm in the process of working through a marvelous book, actually, the best book you can read, but you find it difficult to get hold of. I've got an edition of 1805, which I got from a, a bought from a library, ex-library thing. Six hefty volumes written by the Earl of Clarendon, Douglas Hyde, who was Charles I's second in command. An aristocrat, a cavalier, well, Deal with the word cavalier, cavalier at the moment. Yes, but he was also a very, very acute observer, quite an objective uh, man. I think that's the best, the most thorough work you can read on the English Revolution. The modern books, frankly, they, they how shall I say this in scientific terms, piss and wind, perhaps? Dry as dust, it's like chewing sawdust, re reading this academic uh, nonsense. And no understanding of the process of... The Earl of Clarendon understood the process very well. Of course, he refers to the masses in terms like uh, the mob, the rabble, and above all, the persons of meaner sort, the poor people in other words. But he mentions them and he, he gives them the due weight. He explains what no other book explains. Parliament in those days was surrounded, every day surrounded by a mass, an angry uh, crowd of people. As the parliamentarians would go in, they'd shout and curse them demand action against the king, demand the king be put on trial, and so on. This is fundamental, also women. This is a, f a fundamental element in, in the equation. Of course, at this time, war was inevitable. You could say there was no, no question of resolving any of these questions by negotiation. And yet, now here you see another contradiction opening up. The bourgeoisie in parliament wanted to get concessions from the king, but they didn't want to put the king on trial. They didn't want to fight, they didn't want to abolish the monarchy. They wanted a reasonable, nice constitutional monarchy where they would have real control, but the king could keep his palaces and his, uh, his wealth and, so, and his land and so on and so forth. They didn't want to break from the king. The, the king actually broke with them. He left. He went to York. He turned up outside the, the gates of Hull, which was a walled city at that time. Because there was arms in Hull, he knew there was an arms deposit in Hull, left over from the Bishop's War. He demanded entry, I am the king, let me in. Whereupon the parliamentary governor of Hull said, well, I'm very sorry, sire, but uh, no deal. We are not letting you in. The king was shut out of Hull. This is another step in the direction of uh, war. And the parliament immediately passed, again, this is the most important step, it passed the Ordinance Act. The, Mil the Militia Act, which gave them control effectively of all the armed forces in, in the country and the right to raise an army without the permission of the king. This is war. And the war began. Now, I have no, no intention here, I haven't got the time or the inclination. I need a bit more time than that. To uh, go into the details of the actual civil war. The military question frankly, is not the most important thing, except to say, this is important, in the early stages of the conflict, it was, how shall I say, like a phony war. Uh, no side struck a decisive blow. There was the Battle of Edgehill. On my, bir on my birthday, by the way, 23rd of October, bear it in mind. <laughs> and, uh, but it didn't, to say that, uh, the king had good cavalry under the charge of his nephew, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, who was a German, the nephew of, of Charles. The, the uh, royalist cavalry smashed through the uh, parliamentary uh, forces, led by the Earl of Essex. I'll, so, I'll say something about him in a moment. And the, the situation was only saved, because they, they would have lost, by the parliamentary infantry, which again was the poorer people. The, the, the cavalry were... Uh, aristocrats, if you like, uh, and therefore it ended. Uh, Edge Hill ended as, as a kind of draw game. It wasn't. A, it wasn't a, a success. Then there comes an important point. Charles, after Edge Hill, decided to march on London. If he could, only he could take. They all thought, both the parliamentarians and the, this is going to be over by Christmas. It'll be over quickly. 
we'll strike a dis there'll be a decisive battle, that'll be the end of the story. They marched on London, these puffed up cavaliers. By the way, the word cavalier, what is it? it means precisely a horseman, actually. Trotsky explains that the cavalry also is, is always based on the aristocracy. People who are gonna afford to buy a horse. Aristocrats, farmers, rich farmers, and so on and so forth. Caballero in Spanish, no? Chevalier in French. Horseman. Roundheads was a term of abuse <laughs> directed at the parliamentary uh, crowd because of their haircuts. They were like skinheads, if you like, in more, in more ways than one. They were like skinheads, and therefore they had, whereas the, the cavaliers had, had long, curly locks, which they, they apparently found quite attractive. And the, the parliamentarians tend to shave their heads closely, the round heads, they were called, term of abuse. These, ca ca these cavalieros, these uh, uh, cavaliers, puffed up, and many of them, were, by the way, were professional soldiers, mercenaries from the Thirty Years' War and so on. They were going to take London easily. They advanced. They captured Brentford. There must have been a panic in London at the time. The people must have been terrified. And then there was a, a, a dis the first decisive battle of the Civil War. It's not generally known. It's the Battle of Turnham Green. You, you go on the uh, Piccadilly line, you'll pass through t uh, Turnham Green. It's to the, to the west of London. Where this bunch of cavaliers puffed up with their arrogance encountered a parliamentary force consisting of ordinary working class Londoners. Apprentice boys, that's what they were, the apprentice boys, who formed a militia, but of course they were fired up, they weren't professional soldiers, they had no experience of fighting, but they were prepared to fight and die in the course. They gave the cavaliers such a pasting, they ran like rabbits. They fled, the king, had, king furious, furious of course, at the defeat, he had to retire to Oxford, which then became his capital for the rest of the war. So here you've got two centers, the first expression of dual power, as Trotsky used that expression. London and the South was the basis of Parliament. And Oxford became the centre and the, and the South West and Wales, unfortunately, <coughs> became the basis of uh, the Royalists. But this meant a kind of, 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 of stalemate existed. Now, really speaking, Parliament should have had the advantage and should have easily defeated. No, I'm about to spend, but no, I have to go longer than that. The, the Parliament should have won. They could not win, not because they could, not they, it's not that they could not win, they did not win because of the officers of the parliamentary forces. The Earl of Essex and the Earl of Manchester and others were moderate bourgeois who had no interest in fighting. They had no interest in, in striking a de de decisive victory of the king and they were probably more afraid of the masses behind them than they were of, uh, of King Charles. And therefore there was one, uh, one setback, one military setback after another, until eventually a new force appeared on the scene, which is decisive. Formed by, particularly by Oliver Cromwell, this gentleman, and others, Fairfax and so on. The new model army, now this is important from a political point of view. You, I think you all know Trotsky's theory of the permanent revolution, which in a way it, it implies that in the past the bourgeoisie played a revolutionary role. Well, that's relatively true. Only relatively true. Because if you look at the, the French Revolution, but the English Revolution also, the revolution only succeeded to the degree that control of the war was taken out of the hands of the bourgeoisie and taken over by the radical petty bourgeoisie, in religious terms you're talking about the independence. Small farmers like Oliver Cromwell, who actually said, look, this is no good. We'll never win a war like this. We must base ourselves, if you like, on the men of no property, on the poorest layers. He said, I don't care who joins my army as long as they're good religious people and they're prepared to fight. And he built a powerful, disciplined force called the New Model Army. Incidentally, he understood very well the importance of cavalry and they had very good cavalry from that time uh, onwards. Now, th this New Model Army, I think a few words ne needs to be said. The New Model Army, in my opinion, was like a combination of the Bolshevik Party, the Russian Red Army and the Soviets, all rolled into one. 
It was a democratic institution. People debated. You had the, the famous Putney, Putney Army debate which took place, in which the ordinary soldiers could debate questions of religion, questions of politics, questions of military strategy in front of the officers. The levelers, by the way, were the left wing controlled, had support of the majority of the, of the new, new model army. And it was this army, this marvelous army of, of class fighters. By the way, they even had commissars. Oh, yes. They were known as agitators, whose job it was to inspire the troops by quoting from the Bible, singing psalms, and so on, before the battle. They also played a political role. This was an extraordinary uh, instrument at a very early period. And that made all the difference. The decisive battle was the Battle of Naseby, where the king's forces were shattered. They were shattered by this new, completely new thing. I mean, uh, uh, before that, the armies were, were mercenary soldiers. Here, for the first time, you had a volunteer revolutionary army, and they sliced through the king's forces like a hot knife through butter. The king had to flee. He voluntarily handed himself over to the Scots, hoping that he would uh, intrigue among them. They, they um, nevertheless politely handed him over to Parliament in exchange for a rather large sum of money. It has to be uh, said. They sold him like a, a sack of potatoes to, to the other side. This marks the end of the first civil war because there were two civil wars. Now at that time, incidentally, here you have a new dual power. A new dual power opens up now. The, the whole pendulum swings to the left. And now it's a struggle between the moderate bourgeois Presbyterians in Parliament and this ferocious force, the new model army. In these Putney debates, which took place at that time, by the way, the question for the first time was raised of private property. The levelers were demanding something that nobody else was demanding. Equality, political equality, every, that not everybody, but most people should have the vote. At least property owners should have the vote. Cromwell was horrified. People ask, you know, what's the role of Oliver Cromwell? Was he a revolutionary? Wasn't he? Cromwell was a great revolutionary, yes. But he was a bourgeois revolutionary. He was never a, <laughs> there was never any question of source. He was a property owner. He believed in private property. And what he thought, he was quite right. If we accept, for example, uh, universal suffrage, it means anarchy. That was Cromwell's position. And furthermore, by questioning uh, in a political inequality, you eventually will question private property, and we can't have that. And therefore, Cromwell decided, even at this stage, that he had to crush the left wing. The very people that he'd based himself on, the very people, the most courageous fighters, they had to be crushed. Because he was not in favor of proceeding any further than the strict limits of, of, of bourgeois rule. As a matter of fact, at this stage, I think he honestly wanted to do a deal with the king himself. The king was playing parliament against the army, was trying to, typical devious uh, maneuvering. And Cromwell, to some extent, went along with this. And then you had this, this debate, a, a polarization now within the, within the army itself, between the left and the right wing. And th therefore, Cromwell decided there was a meeting of the army council, apparently, where he pounded the table. And he said, you must understand, the only way we can deal with these uh, men is to crush them, is to crush them mercilessly, which he did. I won't go into all the details, but there was a, a minor war broke out between Cromwell and the levelers, who were eventually crushed mercilessly. The last remnant was defeated in, uh, in a place called Burford, just outside of Oxford. Nice, nice place, you can visit it. In the church, by the way, in Burford, if you go up to the, the place, the, 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 the font, where people are baptized, you will see carved the, the, a name, a carved car, uh, name. One of the levelers, they were held there, 300 of them, were held in the church overnight as prisoners, and in the morning, I think six of the ringleaders were taken out and shot. And one of these guys actually carved his name on the font. You can still see that. It's an interesting bit of uh, history. With this, of course, the English Revolution, from the standpoint of the poor people, was virtually at an end. It was finished. But the Revolution itself was not finished. You still had this conflict between the Parliament, the moderate bourgeois, and the army. 
Parliament was desperately trying to get the king back. They were negotiating a sellout. They were desperately trying to get Charles back on the throne. Of course, if only he would agree to conditions, which he wasn't prepared to do. And in the middle of all this, Charles typically escapes. Got and you have a second civil war. It didn't take long to eliminate. It was quite a bloody affair. By the way, the, the civil war in general was quite a bloody affair. It wasn't a few little skirmishes. Thousands and thousands of people lost their lives. Soldiers and, and civilians, which is not generally realized. However, Cromwell and, and, and the, the radicals in the army were determined that uh, the, the, the king this time was not going to get away with it. Cromwell now stood for the trial and punishment of the king. This man of blood, he called him. This man of blood, which he was. And of course, eventually, he took action against the parliament. There was a struggle, dual power, between the, red, the, not the Red Army, the New Model Army and the, the bourgeoisie in parliament, which again had to be settled by force. It was settled by force. The, uh, there was what, what was known as Pride's Purge. That's the name of a colonel in the, in the, in the New Model Army, Colonel Pride, turned up with a with group of troops and dispersed, but no, I tell a lie. They didn't disperse Parliament, but all those MPs that did not support the, the new model army, all those trying to do a deal with the king would be expelled. They would be kicked out. And they were kicked out, leaving quite a small Parliament. It was that, that's why it's known as the Rump Parliament. And of course, uh, this, uh, that, that in effect almost was the end of the, of the Civil War. Cromwell had defeated the right wing, he defeated the left wing. Only the army was left, armed, and therefore a question of Bonapartism is raised. Bonapartism, in essence, is rule of the sword. And, uh, of course, uh, Cromwell had the power, he had the army in his hand. He therefore declared himself the Lord Protector. And, in effect, he was king in uh, all but name. And with that, if you like, the revolution was defeated. He remained in power until he died, after which the bourgeois in parliament got what they wanted. Incidentally, in the meantime, he also dissolved the rump parliament. He turned up with his hat on his head and uh, said, well, look, you guys are wasting my time. Finish. How I'd like to do that now, wouldn't it be great, you know, to turn up in the parliament with his hat on his head and his shoulders at his back and say, right, you lot, piss off. <laughs> he did, in so many words, you know. And of course they did. And as Marx uh, uh, once commented, as, as these guys sheepishly went through the door, oh, there was an incident, the speaker stood up and he held up the mace. The mace is an instrument which if you hold it up, everyone is supposed to be silent and sit down. This is parliamentary rules. He held up the mace. Cromwell looked around and said to his soldiers, take away that bauble, that toy, take away that bauble. That was his idea of so-called parliamentary authority. And as they sheepishly crept through the door, he cursed every single one of them by name. There goes an adulterer. There goes a thief. Which, of course, must have aroused considerable cheers from the assembled uh, soldiery. That was the end of the rump, the, the rump parliament, the end of... Uh, the English Civil War. Yes, not quite. I must say a P.S. to this. You see, the English Civil War ended, ended in, from, from the standpoint of the masses, it ended in, in defeat, but it had to end in defeat. It was too early to pose the question of socialism and communism at the time, but it was posed. It was posed implicitly by the levelers in the army and people like John Lilburn, very courageous man, but also by another tendency I mentioned earlier, a small tendency, a bit like ourselves, if you like, who called themselves the true levelers, the true levelers, known, to, known historically as the diggers, because they turned they turn up in history in an area of the south of England. They went to an area and they began to dig the land, private land. They began to dig it as collective property, plant their, prop, their crops, they stood for communism. They stood for the abolition of private property. The leader was Gerald Winstanley, a great man, a marvelous writer, who wrote a whole series of very interesting books and pamphlets 
The title of one of which sticks in my mind is a marvellous title. The world turned upside down and that's what they wanted. You know, these heroic people, they were heroic people. The soldiers in the new model army, the poor artists, the, the uh, apprentices in London, the women and so on. They were not, they were, what, what, what were they fighting for? I'll tell you what they were fighting for. They were fighting for the establishment of God's kingdom on earth. Not in heaven, God's kingdom right here on earth. They were Democrats, no priests, no bishops, democratic churches. These are, if you like, uh, the, the essence of, of a struggle of the masses for a fundamental change in society. And the most advanced of them were the diggers, who are our spiritual and political ancestors. We stand on their shoulders of these heroic people, who as a minority were prepared to suffer persecution, imprisonment, whipping, death, anything, in the great cause of the struggle for the emancipation of the human race. That's a source of eternal inspiration for ourselves. And I'll end on that note. We are fighting today to finish what the levelers and the diggers began so many years ago. A struggle for a better world purged of priests, bishops, kings, capitalists, generals. A world fit for men and women to live in. A world of true leveler principles. A world of international communism.